Okay, I think I started recording again there. So. Well, I think it's seven, so I'll start by introducing introducing you here, John. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, please feel free to chat and type comments and questions in the chat. And then afterwards, uh, I want to open it up and just have people discuss and visit and chat and and you know, if they're doing uh, some some of similar things to what John's doing you know, give some tips and tricks and tell John what he's doing wrong. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, but really kind of as a learning thing, you know, ask questions, find out what the challenges are and, and, you know, drill down a little bit. And cause I mean, we're not doing this as our farm. Uh, so I'm going to be learning as much as anyone else here tonight. So, um, yeah. And so I want to welcome John Colk. He's a neighbor of ours, farms in the Enchant area and, uh, yeah, pretty diverse farm from pulses, oil seeds, all kinds of cereals, kind of whatever's whatever looks to be making some money, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, which is like any of us. So, John, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, thank you for so much for joining us. I really appreciate. I really appreciate it. Hey, yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I, uh, I probably should put a caveat on this um, that. Um, uh, this is not based on a lot of science and replication yet. This is our first year. So I kind of put this down like <clears throat> it's mostly around opinions. And um, somebody has said that opinions are like assholes. Everyone has one. They are useful, but it's not always wide to, wise to publicly display them. And uh, I guess I'm taking the risk and I'll publicly display my opinions on, on strip till. Um, so uh, been watching the whole strip till concept in the states for a number of years especially it's it's the row crop uh, corn and soy guys that are doing most of it um, a few bean guys in in north dakota um, and, and so we were looking at it and and i think we all know some of the challenges so maybe if you move to the uh, next slide um, kind of give you some rationale why we decided to move into this concept so uh, here's a quick picture of a 12, so we got 12 row strip till unit on 22 inch um, centers. Uh, partly for those of you that aren't in this area, we have a lot of 22 inch uh, here, the sugar beets uh, in particular, uh, some of the beans are all 22 inch uh, centers. So it's not the 30 inch centers that you see in the States or uh, in some other areas that it doesn't work with the rest of our crops. So that's why we've gone to 22. So this was a, um, a stubble, uh, a cereal stubble crop. Um, unfortunately, we went in in the spring, uh, was probably a little bit, a little bit cold and, and uh, a little bit wet, but you can kind of see that, that it really leaves some trash on top and still gives a little bit of a seed bed. Uh, so if you wanna go to the next slide, Greg. So I, I think the biggest thing is why, why do you get into this business? <clears throat> and in particular, um, last year, not this past year, but the previous year, I had some, uh, some uh, bean ground that we had tried to seed some uh, winter wheat or winter rye into it, just got it in too late, just never got it started. Once it started blowing, it was virtually impossible to stop. And, uh, and we just, uh, every farmer gets sick when they see land blowing in Southern Alberta, if you got lighter land, it, it's, uh, it's an issue. And, and we've seen a bit more of it again this past year. So our, my primary driver to look at, at strip till was to try and, try and leave some of the ground with more roots in it and not as disturbed and trying to reduce the wind erosion. Um, also, not just in the fall, but also in the spring when you just seeded it, uh, there's nothing like a, a hard blasting wind from the north and that sand will just cut those young plants right off. Uh, the other thing that we looked at is uh, we've been typically doing a third of the field or the entire field when we do tillage for especially seed canola, dry beans, um, and, and quite often the corn as well. Uh, this way, instead of tilling the whole field or even tilling it twice, we were just going through and tilling one third of the field uh, or just the, the seven inch strips. 
Um, the other option or the other thing was uh, to warm up a seed bed. That's not a big deal on dry beans. Uh, it is a big deal for our corn and sometimes for our canola. I was hoping that we could improve water infiltration. We have uh, some soils that are fairly low organic matter and um, water infiltration wasn't always the best. So you get some crusting and whatnot. So just trying to improve that. We're hoping it'll improve soil health. I, I don't know how we measure soil health yet, but uh, we're hoping that not disturbing as much soil would, uh, would um, allow earthworms and uh, the various little soil mites and whatnot to have an undisturbed portion of the field. And then uh, I wanted to try and put fertilizer in. Our planter, we don't have a planter that we can add fertilizer to the seed um, or next to the seed row. Uh, we could do a little bit of liquid, but uh, it's not like we can with our, um, our drills. So those are kind of the rationale that we put together. Um, and Greg, if you see anybody pulling a chat question up, um, if you want to let me know what the question is, that's, um, that would be fine. Go for so it. yeah, if you go to the next one. Next slide. Yeah. So some of my concerns, um, the cost of the changeover, um, you know, we did a bunch of investigating. It's uh, just a, a strip row unit. Uh, American dollars, um, you know, pretty quick. You're at four thousand uh, bucks for for one unit, and so if you got twelve of them, um, you know, you're you're up at fifty thousand dollars plus you need a, a toolbar. Um, the cost of a dry, we said we weren't going to try um, liquid fertilizer on this thing. We wanted to do it with dry fertilizer. So just the cost of of the dedicated strip till the fertilizer units was pretty high. Uh, Monag and some of these other ones do it. And then we didn't know how much time it would take during a busy seeding season. So, you know, you're usually, if you're just doing tillage, you can send somebody out there and get it done a day or two before you got to go and seed. Um, we didn't know how well this was going to work. And, uh, and then particular to our operation uh, with dry beans, we use an undercutting process and um, if you're undercutting and you've only tilled one third of the field, well, the question is how hard is it gonna to be to undercut your beans and still do a good job? And then for both our seed canolas and our, our uh, beans, we use a, a pre-seed uh, pre weed control edge, which typically would get worked in when you use the dry stuff. So those were some of the concerns that we had going in but we nevertheless decided to try and go forward. Next one. So can you run this one, uh, Greg? Oh, is it actually a video? Yeah. Oh, what's going? It's gone now. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Turn the sound down. It's working as you expected there, John? Yeah, it's a little lump. Um, it's a little, a little cho choppy. Dirty. Yeah, that's okay. Did you want me to try and play that one again? Or? Yeah, if you want to play it once more, I'll just talk it through for a minute then. Okay, so um, we're, uh, we got a row crop tractor. We, uh, we left the duals on it. <clears throat> so we're just going straight into stubble here. Um, you'll notice there's a big heavy toolbar behind the tractor. And then we put a gooseneck on it so that the weight of the fertilizer spreader is not on the toolbar. Um, and then the hoses are there. So we are applying fertilizer through those hoses there. Uh, had a lot of headaches with that, but we did get that figured out. And uh, so it's a shank or it's a, it's a disc, sorry, it's first a coulter disc, then a shank. Uh, and next to the shank are two, uh, two discs that kind of keep it from throwing the dirt too far. 
and then you've got the little uh, rolling basket packer. And, uh, and then the fertilizer spreader was being pulled behind. I'll talk a bit more about the headaches I had with that. So you've got a gooseneck to your three point hitch for that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, because we didn't want to be, because as the weight changes on the fertilizer spreader, we didn't want the weight changing on the, uh, the tillage bar. Okay, so that's why we goosenecked it over top. Plus, it was a way of running the, the hoses uh, with the fertilizer. What was the, the question there? I didn't quite get the uh, question. Would it not leave a better finish if the strips were across the cereal rows? So if you went 90 degrees to what you're doing there? Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a good question. Um, this was because it's, it's a, a two quarters in a row. <laughs> It was less turning if we could go straight through. So I, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, it, it might actually, it's probably something we, we need to look at. I think it would make a little bit better, uh, better look. Yeah. I think Lee had something too. Yeah. What do you plan to seed and why not just direct seed? Okay. So this, uh, this is a crop, of, it's going to be corn. So it's early in the season. Uh, ground's pretty cold yet. And uh, our seed, our planter for corn doesn't have the down pressure. Actually, if I go back for a minute, the whole thing started, I wanted to get more down pressure on my planter so I could direct seed. And as I went through the costs of doing that and changing my planter, uh, came to the conclusion maybe we're better off using strip till for the various advantages it has. So there are people who direct uh, no-till corn in. Uh, one of the risks in southern Alberta is we don't warm up quite enough so you tend to have pretty cold soils and corn hates cold feet. So um, that's why we're going with the, with the strip till. Uh, this was sometime in early April. Any other questions on uh, any other chat questions? Nothing that I see. Okay. Okay, maybe next uh, next slide. Okay, and, and here's just a, kind of a, a little closer up picture for the people that like being uh, looking at the, at the details. These are a Yetter row or Yetter row unit. Uh, if you look at the top right of your screen, you can see the uh, the two wheels that you set your your depth at for the coulter. So it's a it's a way or it's not a wavy coulter it's it's a, a notched coulter. Um, then right below that, um, you can see the one disc that and the, and part of the shank with the fertilizer applicator in there. So that shank we were running down about seven and a half to eight inches, um, but amazingly it was not a hard pull. I think the coulter in front helped. And, uh, and then it's a pretty narrow, uh, narrow opener. And the fertilizer is distributed right down towards the bottom of that, uh, probably down at six, six and a half inches uh, down. Um, the two wheels that you can see by the culture help to maintain uh, the depth. And so we did not have a lot of trouble with, with uh, the depth uh, changing. That, that actually worked fairly well. The one thing about a shank ripper is it leaves the soil a bit fluffy and leaves some open areas. And uh, I'll talk about that briefly later. Then on the, uh, on the left side, you can kind of see the unit. We, uh, the hoses that are coming up off of each unit um, are not connected to fertilizer. We did some of it without putting fertilizer so that we just, uh, we didn't have the fertilizer spreader on. Uh, there's a rolling basket. Because of the 22 inch width and um, uh, the Yetter is fairly narrow compared to an Northman, but we still had to offset them 12 inches. So each, um, every other one is offset 12 inches. So, and, and that was because we were worried if we were working with especially corn trash, um, whether we would end up with problems. So, so we have to offset each row unit um, about 12 inches. So the first one's on, the, on the, the bar, second one, the bar is set back 12 inches and, and that's the way it is all the way across. 
Next one. So our equipment choices, um, we, uh, and, and there's, uh, I, I wouldn't say that, that Yetter is worse or better. Uh, there's a number of good units out there. I think um, Alloway used to even have a unit. And in fact, the one unit I did look at in Southern Alberta here was, uh, I think it was Alloway. It was a sugar beet equipment outfit. Um, there was an older one, Pepnik's still run it on their sugar beets. Um, so, but we went with uh, Yetter row units. Uh, because of rocks, we have a trip. Uh, we, had, we do have a trip on the uh, shank. Um, it's a narrow profile. The one challenge is it's a fairly long unit. It's, it's a good four and a half feet long. And so on side hills, it might give us some headaches. We don't have a lot of side hills. Um, and uh, we'd worked with some Yetter row cleaners before. So we kind of knew the quality of their product. And so that's why we chose the Yetters. Um, it's a shank unit with a trip for rocks. We have a rolling bar basket for firming and breaking up the clumps. Uh, you'll see everything from, from uh, rubber packing wheels to just a chain drag behind it for firming. Uh, because we were gonna do spring quite often, we decided to use a rolling basket. Um, we just had, um, had uh, Kirchner in Lethbridge uh, build the toolbar and actually put uh, place everything on the unit. So we worked with them. Um, and then uh, we had to offset, I mentioned that. And then we adapted our Selford fertilizer tank for tool behind. So we had, we had a Selford tank. It's, uh, it's actually just a, a 60 foot unit, but it had, um, it had the right number of, um, of runs so that we could uh, we could set the whole thing up so that we'd have a, a run to each individual shank. There was a question there, I think, from Sam. Or something. Yeah, is 22 inch not too wide for weed control? I don't... Okay, so strip till is not used for weed control. So the strip till is strictly there to prepare a seed bed. Um, when you go to weed control later, and, and uh, we do that in beans, not in some of the other crops, but when you go to weed control, you'll actually cultivate like you used to do in the sugar beets, you would cultivate in between the rows, and that would be a completely different unit. So 22 inch is where the seed is going to go down on, and that's the size of our, that's the distance of our planter. So we're not doing any weed control. It is strictly prepping the surface, opening it up six, seven inches, and then getting a, warming the soil up um, and, and getting a seed bed that we can directly seed in with the, the Monison or John Deere planter. John, tied to that, would it not make sense to potentially spread edge ahead of your strip till or, or some residual so that you get some edge in your stubble and you get some edge six inches deep so that you've got wherever you're disturbing or not, you've got that residual herbicide or... Right, so so the um, typically the recommendation on edge is either you water it in or you till it in twice. Um, and there might be other uh, dry stuff that you can use differently. But the issue here is where it was deep, it would be too deep for effective use of edge and where it was not disturbed, your edge wouldn't necessarily go to work. So what we did to adapt to that, we have irrigation. So we actually spread the edge on the, a couple fields right after we were done, or after we were done, uh, done seeding, and then we watered it in. Mm. And um, we had relatively effective weed control that way for the pre-emerge. So whether that's an ideal, the, the other option is uh, something like an authority on some crops. So then you can use a spray and you can spray it on and you don't need to till it. Hmm. Okay, I think maybe uh, next slide. So um, some of the challenges and problems we ran into um, that gooseneck hitch between the toolbar and the fertilizer unit 
was kind of a monstrosity. Uh, it was kind of big and we were running all the hoses uh, to it. Um, but I mean, it worked. It just, uh, it looks like a bit of a, a bit of an odd thing. Uh, the one surprise, hadn't thought about it at all. We're used to using um, seed tanks, like a John Deere seed tank, and they are pressurized tanks, but the fertilizer spreaders basically drop the fertilizer down and then the airflow takes it through. So you don't have constant or you don't have pressure. So we had an issue that the back pressure, because these hoses were all running down into the shanks and into the ground, we had too much back pressure. And so we couldn't move the fertilizer through at the rates we wanted to move it through. So we ended up um, kind of patching up around the uh, the feed on the on the Salford so that we had a little less blow by and then we drilled a bunch of holes in just above this the shank so that the air would be blasting out because we had to get the fertilizer to flow through uh, all the way through and then drop into the into the row um, so that was a bit of a headache um, was there a question on that uh, somewhat similar. Um, uh, Byron says he's seen planters in the U.S. that have mid-row banders mounted a few inches beside and below the seed placement directly on the planter while towing a cart. So beside the lack of warming that you might get, uh, is there a downside to that no-till if, if you could go that route and hook up your Salford to a planter that way? I, I, there's a lot of guys messing with, with, um, with side band or with uh, mid row banders. And, and I, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, it's, it would be a great, um, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a really workable thing as long as you've got the season for it. So we needed some of the warming up and on dry beans, um, we just as soon be putting the fertilizer below them. They don't have the root, the root, um, distribution that you would get with a canola crop or uh, or a, um, a corn crop. I mean, corn's just got a lot more roots and, and they'll find it a lot quicker. Whereas the dry beans, um, the fertilizer probably wouldn't be quite as effective uh, as quickly in the season, although you don't need a lot the first couple of months, in the first couple of weeks. So um, I, I think I think that the side banding or the side or mineral banding with a planter unit, uh, I mean, you get pretty complicated machine at that point with a lot of moving parts. But um, I, I think for a lot of purposes, that's probably uh, less complicated than, than going with a strip till. Just because we have three different crops that we use this on with certain different requirements uh, strip till was was where we decided to to chase down. Um, and then, uh, so the fertilizer tank had uh, had the narrow um, narrow tires on it, and we couldn't for the life of us keep them from sliding in. Like we changed the width and everything else, and either you were packing one row or the other row. <coughs> So I was not very happy. So the, the, end, the end result was out of 12 rows, we usually had one row that was more packed than the other rows. And uh, that did become a little bit of an issue with seeding later. Um, some of them have steerable tires on the Monags or they have a fixed, a fixed unit on the toolbar. Um, those are probably all options I wasn't Probably we'll try some wider tires, like if we try to go to, to 30 inch wide tires, then the packing will not be as big an issue on the, on the freshly strip, uh, the freshly tilled strips. Um, John, do you fourth think, point, I guess, on the corn. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. do you think uh, if you had just went liquid, would it just be way too much product to try and get onto your tractor or you know, for what you're doing, you have to go with, uh, and cost wise, I suppose granular is cheaper as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I wanted to go with, with, um, 
wanted to go with dry fertilizer, partly for cost. I mean, when, when you're dropping it on corn, we were dropping, uh, you know, 180 pounds or so on. We still, we do some, we do put some fertilizer on the corn as it's growing through the season, but um, you still put quite a bit down. And, uh, and to try and put that much liquid down, I mean, at 20 to 30% higher than granular, uh, that was not attractive. Um, and uh, what was, there was another partial question there. I, I missed uh, part would, of the questions. Would strip till work better uh, in the fall? Would, would strip till in the fall work better than the okay, yeah. rolls out a bit more? Yes. So the recommended, probably the recommendations you'd hear from Ontario and the Midwest is strip till in the fall, uh, depending on your climate, whether you put some fertilizer down or not but you strip till in the fall and then just freshen it in the spring. And um, I didn't have time this fall to, to do that, but definitely this coming year, um, if we've got clarity on what, what we're putting in that field the next year, we do want to strip till in the fall. It, it makes a lot more sense um, all the way around. And some of the other items that, that I'll raise here that were issues would not be issues if we strip till in the fall. So. I think the and Pepnix and Vauxhall on Sandy Land, I think they strip till in the fall, I'm pretty sure, and then just freshen it in the spring. So yes, um, all the advisors would tell you that you should primarily focus your strip tillage in the fall. Um, we are we deal with uh, seed canola and sometimes you don't know what quarter that's going into until two weeks before seeding. So sometimes we can't strip till all of the, the crops that we want to strip till. Um, so we're going to have to do some spring strip tilling regardless. But I, I think that is, yeah, it's the right thing to do uh, from everything I've been told, but we haven't actually done it yet. So um, yeah, fourth point, I guess, on the corn, we went in some pretty cold soils. Actually, it was fairly warm when we stripped it, but it, it got, uh, the soil was still a bit, a bit lumpy and we had air spaces in there. Had we had another, we probably should have strip tilled and then given it four or five days to let the soil settle down before we went to seed. Um, we ended up with some really poor germination. We were targeting 34 and a half thousand seeds uh, an acre. Um, our actual and on corn usually you know you get pretty good termination and better than in some of the seed salesmen that we we get Greg <laughs> germination on corn is better than the cereals no I'm just kidding <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but uh, we meat? ended up with probably a count of about 30,000 plants per acre so um, we uh, we probably lost 11 percent of what we seeded and uh, that's of course nowhere near acceptable and it was very uneven so when we dug back into it uh, partly because of the unevenness um, and, and, the, and the whole or the kind of air pockets in there um, we had a lot of uh, plants that started and died because they hit air um, so so yeah we had a, a very poor germination now that was not true on, on the seed canola or the beans um, and on one quarter of corn, which we went just a bit later on, uh, we had like, we were up in the, in the high nineties on germ. So there we had, I think 33,000, 33 and a half thousand plants. So it was, it was mostly our mistakes um, that we just didn't do a good job on it. But the point, the other point I would make on this one with the strip till, I thought we wouldn't have much trouble with our planter to get the depth right. I, I had the guys set it a little too deep. I wanted to go deeper with corn. Um, and we ended up with a range of seeds at four and a half inches up to about an inch and a half. And we were targeting about two and a quarter inches. Um, so we have changed our planter to put some downforce on it so that we have constant, um, so we, we have changed our planter to 
address the issue of, of getting the seeds all at the same depth. Um, so that was part of our learning. Uh, the fifth point is ideally with strip till, you should build a small berm to put the seed into. And we just couldn't quite figure out how to set the, um, the, the discs on the side of the shank to get a nicely built um, berm for the seed to go into. Um, I think we've got that figured out. We, we just had to do a bit more adjusting, but that was another uh, thing that we did wrong. Okay, next one. Um, so what worked well? Um, once the soil warmed up and dried up, for beans and the canola, we had a really nice seed bed. I mean, the, uh, the canola was like little soldiers in the field, the way that came up, because we only seed at about uh, a pound and a half an acre uh, for seed canola. And uh, yeah, we, um, our, our germination on that was just beautiful. Uh, it did pull quite easy, even at the seven to eight inch depth. I mean, I was amazed how, how well that thing pulled. And, and we were doing about five and a half to six miles an hour. And, and uh, so we, we did get through it. It did take a bit of time during seeding, but um, it, uh, we had a, a unit for it. And uh, I was pretty happy with, with how that, that worked. I, it did really save us uh, fuel compared to, especially when we do two tillage passes uh, in the spring. First, you're trying to work the trash in and then, uh, you know, then you got to smooth it out. So we, uh, we ended up doing less work on those 10 or 12 quarters of, or 10 quarters of strip till than we would have been a normal year. Um, we only applied fertilizer on the corn. Um, I did have a pretty big shock though. Um, we accidentally didn't put fertilizer on a strip. And uh, so I went in the combine during, uh, when we were uh, combining and uh, wow, <laughs> I was pretty convinced that that fertilizer down there really did make a difference. Even though I don't think we would have been that short on fertilizer, it really did show up in the, in the yield. Um, it definitely did reduce wind erosion um, because those, those, um, those roots that were still in, in the ground in between the rows and, and even some of the stubble that was in, and that was on a few different kinds of crops. Um, we had a few wins when the crops was, were just coming out of the ground. And um, yeah, I, uh, that just made me happy not to see wind and not see dust blowing, it was, it was quite good. And then uh, water infiltration, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure how to measure it. I think it was better. It seemed like it was better, but I, I don't think I can say I can, I know how to measure it. Um, and then on uh, dry beans, so, so when I say beans, it's not soybeans, it's, uh, it's uh, pintos and, and Great Northern and things like that. So they did well on the strip till compared to the conventional till. So we actually did conventional till on one quarter or a couple quarters and, um, and strip till. Um, and, and just so you know, and somebody who was asking about, um, about um, weed control, on the beans, we do go through with a damodiker um, after the beans are up a ways, just so we leave pockets for water to infiltrate into, and that's also some weed control. Um, so that uh, turned out that we, uh, for cutting, undercutting beans, and we, we did one of them on a cornfield, and I was very worried about that because those corn stalks and those corn roots are a mess in the spring. By the time we cut that field, uh, really was not anywhere near the headache. There was a water breakdown. Um, so even though in the spring you looked at that bean field and say, how are you gonna cut that with you know, stalks 6, 12, 15 inches long and then pretty thick. Um, it, uh, I, was, I was very surprised how well that worked because uh, my guy that was on the bean cutter, he was worried all, all spring and uh, half the summer what how is he going to cut those damn beans. Uh, there was a question there, I think. Yeah, from Arnie, was there any cereal stubble left this fall 
to prevent wind erosion. So I'm assuming that's kind of on the, on the dry bean fields, maybe mostly, but yeah, any cereal level left? Um, so there was, although I'm kind of surprised. I mean, it, it really did break down, like I said, about the corn as well. Um, and and uh, on the dry beans, because we end up um, cutting the entire field right across, um, that doesn't really help us quite enough uh, on dry beans. So, um, uh, but there was some, there was a bit of stubble, but it was pretty broken down, Arnie. Like, uh, you know, cause we, the one field we were in was a, was a fall rye. And I mean, there was a lot of stubble there. It was, uh, and that's got a lot of root. Um, it mellowed out. It seems to be absorbed into the soil. Um, but I, uh, I wouldn't say there was that much left once we were into the, into the fall. And even on our canola fields, yeah, I think you can still see a couple little sticks, but not very much. Um, but, but the soil on the corn and on the canola was not disturbed in between. So for a full, almost two years, that the, every, there's 12 inches or 14 inches of soil that was not disturbed at all. And I, I do think that it was holding, it held the ground. So this fall on our seed canola fields, we haven't had any blowing yet. Uh, even though we, we, we did harrow it, but um, we haven't had blowing there. On the bean stubble though, we did put some cover crops on. So that's, uh, that's why they're holding right now. Uh, John, but Does that answer that question, and Arnie? I'm not sure if I got the right answer or if I got the, your whole question. Yeah, he nodded there. Um, okay. Also, but feel free to, oh, Arnie, you can, uh, do you have a comment there, Arnie? No, I, that, that, that answered the question. I was just, you know, looking at it, at the, uh, the picture of it, what you had last spring, you were wondering how much of that was left to, uh, to prevent anything from uh, going in the fall. Yeah, and it, it, was quite a, it was an amazing amount of breakdown. I, I maybe haven't paid as much attention when we do normal tillage. Um, but yeah, I was kind of surprised. It wasn't, uh, we were not getting getting stuff in the in the swath in the bean swaths or anything like we weren't uh, we had it before where you didn't do a very good job on tillage and there was a lot of trash that ended up in the in the bean swath which is hard to dry down uh, did not have that issue it, uh, uh, ben ben asked on beans are you using a conventional undercutting or one step picket it's a it's a one step picket uh, toe behind and then Lee, uh, you mentioned fall rye earlier. Are you wanting to use it as a cover crop? If you are strip tilling, does that eliminate the need for a cover crop? Um, well, uh, if we could find good markets for fall rye, you know, I'd, I'd grow it as a crop for next year. We, we put some hybrid fall rye into beans that we'll use as a, that we hope to take as a crop. We also put some fall rye, the non-hybrid stuff in on a couple of quarters just to grow something, just to put some roots down and, and keep it from blowing in the, in the, um, during the winter. Um, so what, what was the rest on that, on that rye question? Well, I think it was, um, uh, are you wanting to use your rye as a cover crop? Um, and if you are oh, right. does it eliminate the need for a cover crop? Yeah, I'm not sure if I've got a picture coming up where we actually um, strip tilled into a cover crop, into a rye cover crop. Is it on the next one, uh, Greg, or not? I don't know. I can click. Uh, oh, maybe, eh? Yes. Okay. So, so uh, I wouldn't, uh, Lee, I would not be scared of actually moving to strip tilling into a green crop and then burning it. Um, that uh, actually the soil there, this, this went into canola. Um, man, uh, yeah, I was very impressed. Like that canola came up like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and, and, uh, it was a Cortiva, um, uh, seed canola crop. And, and, uh, I think they dragged out one of their managers to come and look at it, uh, just because how it, because when the guy came out to see my seeded crop of the stuff, he phoned me up and said, what in the hell are you doing? Like, you're supposed to cultivate this and, you know, have it all ready. And, and he looked at this 
but once he started seeing the crop come up uh, and and the weed control we had so I would not be at all scared to strip till into a cover crop I um, as, as long as you got a way of killing it and um, I think there might be some real major benefits to it um, it um, yeah uh, and, and it's mostly uh, because we don't have the ability to no-till our, our um, row crops. Uh, that's why we're using the strip tool. I think you can go back uh, one slide. Yeah, that looked really mellow. That was... Oh, it, it was beautiful. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Yeah, so I talked... Oh, yeah. We did have one field where we have pretty low organic matter uh, that was... Um, strip till for beans and then we uh, we did damodike it and, uh, and that one pulled pretty hard and we're not quite sure why other than it's it's a field we're still trying to build organic matter up on so I, I don't know any answers on that one okay yeah next uh, or unless there's a question next uh, next slide so this was strip till and green cover um, I'm actually quite interested in that I uh, I was very impressed with that one. Go on. More, more rye. Oh, for oh, Steve. oh Steve, Steve, you got a question? Yeah, so what did you see that fall rye into? What was the previous crop? Do you know, I'm trying to think which quarter this was. I'm almost thinking that this was, we took fall rye off in our combines, uh, you know, uh, the kind of combine that, that uh, does double duty. <laughs> it takes some of the crop off and it seeds the rest of it. So, <laughs> but I just let it grow on purpose because, uh, yeah. So, so actually, this stuff uh, we had some. Uh, I think it was wind damage on that on that field in uh, the fall before, and so there was uh, there was some seeds that landed, and then we watered them up and just let them grow on purpose. Um, question on the, how wide this is. So this is a 22 inch. Okay. Um, the strip till the actual strip would be about six, seven inches wide, but there's a bit of dirt that's, that's thrown with the, with the discs. So it, it's a 22 inch. So where you see the actual standing crop there, and I'm not sure this is the greatest picture, but where you see it, um, there would probably be about eight inches of undisturbed and, um, and then another five, six inches that, that weren't torn up but have some dirt thrown on top of them. And, and I think I mentioned earlier, we did have some adjustment issues on next to the, the disc or next to the shank. We did have a few issues on getting that set right and I think we're still messing with it. Guess we'll go to the next one, unless there's a question. Okay, um, so here's, uh, you kind of have to look at these pictures. So this is the corn that you had seen where the, uh, the video was. Um, you can see that there's stubble next to it, but we had too much of a dip and it did sink down. Um, so I would like it piled up a little bit better. So that corn, you can see it's coming up actually right there. It didn't come up too badly, but you can see the trash that's still, uh, and this is pretty light soil. The next one is beans on corn up in the top right. So you can see there's quite a bit of trash there. Uh, most of the trash in the actual seed row is gone, but there is a lot of trash in between it. And then the bottom one is also a bean. And uh, you can see how they kind of break the soil there. So sometimes with bean, beans, we have crusting issues. And we, this really seemed to help with crusting issues. So sometimes with the beans, um, you know, if, if you've done the normal tillage, um, you kind of got to break through that crust because you put a little bit of water on or it rains or something. And you can see that there's not that really bad crust in that bottom one. And those beans are coming out pretty nice. And that one is in a cereal stubble there. So you can see the kind of the cereal along the side. So yeah, that's, uh, and you can kind of see it's, it's pretty light soil, uh, you know, not a pile of organic material and 
pretty liable to blowing. Next question, or next slide, I mean. Okay, so uh, next steps. Um, the picture, by the way, is some fall rye that was put in. It wasn't as early as I would like to have, but this was about a week ago. So there's still green stuff and, and there was still growth and it, it's in a bean field. So those little seeds that you see are some uh, beans that didn't end up in the combine. Um, so that was on a bean field and, and uh, yeah, that one hasn't blown and I'm pretty happy with how that worked. That was a strip tilled field in the fall, in the spring. And, and this so, is targeting for, a, this is a cover crop? Was this the? Uh, this is just a cover crop. It's not, uh, it's not for production. Okay. No. So next steps for us, um, we're going to do a bit more on cover crop. I had a kind of a, an aha moment. I was putting some pipe in in January of all things, uh, trenching. And so I had to trench through this field here. And uh, I had to trench partially in some dry land, partially in this field and partially in a field that didn't have any cover crop on it. And uh, we'd had, I don't know, maybe some 10, 12 below weather. There was six to seven inches of hard frost where there was no cover crop. And there was three inches of frost in the ground uh, and it was softer under with even just this much cover. Um, so I just looked at that and go, oh, that soil is, is things, different things are happening there even after our winter, you know, having a 10, 15 below for a few nights. So it, it was, uh, it, it really makes me think that this idea of having something growing somehow in the fall and in the spring may have some benefits. I just don't know how we're going to measure them and how we can justify the cost of, of that additional pass and, and the additional seed. But I, I am getting more and more interested in it. Just can't afford the cover crop mixes that stamp seeds put so. <laughs> you knew that was coming, right, Greg? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I was ready for it. <laughs> Good. Um, and then the next steps, we need to improve our fertilizer application. I don't think I have got that down at all yet. Um, I hate to have to go to the really expensive systems they have in the States, but I, I hopefully we can fix ours or get ours to work a little better. Uh, like I mentioned, we tried some fall rye for cover crop this year and then consider some strip till in the fall like we have some time. And then the next one. Um, so I've got that picture. This is what drives me. Uh, fortunately, this is not my picture, but this is a, this spring or this uh, winter picture from a neighbor. Um, uh, so what drives me to, to get this right is this is a, a bean field. Uh, this was a bean field and uh, that wind, you can see what's in the ditch there and, and how much, you know, even the cover, even the uh, bean stubble blew into the ditch. So um, that's what's motivating me to keep working on this. Uh, so strip till, I guess, would have met most of our expectations. I think that most of the challenges seem solvable, you know, doing a bit more fall strip tilling, uh, giving us ourselves a bit more time between strip tilling and seeding in the spring and getting the fertilizer thing done a little better. Um, I think all of that seems like it's solvable. And then while I'm expecting that I'm going to have soil health benefits, I do not know how to measure them yet. Uh, Lee, what was that question? Uh, so you want to conserve soil. It is costing X amount for equipment. Is there any other return on investment like higher yield, reduced inputs, etc.? You know, um, we didn't do as so we didn't didn't leave a lot of test strips. We had we had a couple, but we didn't leave a lot of them. So this is kind of combine observation. I would say that on the dry beans, we probably had a small boost in production. So three, four percent maybe. So, you know, on a, on a 25, uh, 2,500 pound um, 
field. Yeah, we probably added a uh, hundred pounds maybe. And with today's seed prices that, that paid its way. Seed canola, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we knocked it out of the park this year on, on, on a couple of the fields. Um, not sure I can attribute all of that to strip tilling because uh, we also had a really good year for growing seed canola. Um, I, I think that over time on average, I hope to see a 5% boost in yield. Okay, I, I, there's, no, there's no facts to that one right now, that's opinion. Uh, is there any difference in corn yields between strip till and conventional, conventional tillage? Um, I, I didn't do enough test strips there, but um, if, if I would have got on the field that I got my germination right, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I, that one, I, I think this is going to be a slam dunk. I, I definitely would think we had a yield advantage there. Um, probably on a on a 162, moving it up to a 170 bushel. So John, I have a question. So say, say the, the rye as a cover crop worked well, what, what if you were to say, okay, let's do a fall, to, let's, let's plant more rye for a cover crop and do normal tillage in the fall and get that rye go, growing and then plant stuff into that as, a, you know, in the spring and do a burn off. Would that benefit in any way or is strip tillage still a better option for, for, for whatever reason? Mm. Um, well, I mean, we're trying to get away from as much tillage as we can. So even if we were putting rye on, yeah. um, we would just do it with a disc drill. And, and, you know, so we wouldn't touch it really, maybe you have to harrow at a, at a maximum. Um, Cause I'm trying to get away from I want to reduce how much tillage I do on this land. Yeah, but it might not warm uh, up your soil as fast for some crops, and then and then it might. Yeah, you might. Yeah, not so do so it. the soil warming. So for corn, strip till probably still would have an advantage. Um, beans, I I don't know. I I'm not sure how many guys are doing row crop beans, direct seed yet. I am. I'm not sure about that one. I I don't have an answer on that. Seed canola. I mean, you got to kind of work with what the what the um, seed companies wants there, and so we do need to, you know, do we need to work with them? But they uh, they were pretty cooperative, and I, and I think we'll see them, especially. Um, I think Bassif and, and probably Cortiva as well. They're both looking at sustainability metrics, and so I, I do think that they probably are looking very hard at this as an option for we reducing tillage and, uh, and improving soil health. Yeah, I, I don't know that outside of row crops that strip till makes any sense. I mean, I think you need it, it has to be for row crops and, you, and you've got to have your reasons to do it. Uh, there is other ways of, of, you know, fixing this wind erosion problem. Um, if the water infiltration is helpful, I think that might be a benefit on, on irrigation. Um, so yeah, like I said, we've had one year experience and I kind of gave you the rationale why we looked at it. Um, and I guess in a few years, if we're still doing it, maybe we're seeing a benefit. Um, for John, for weed control. So did, did you see like weeds coming at different timings because you had some untilled versus some tilled and causing you different flushes at different times that you wouldn't normally have if you'd done one pass across the whole field? Well, I mean, corn, you got your Roundup um, um, chemistry. So that was not an issue. I mean, we really, with corn, you really want to keep your, um, you, you know, you, you don't want competition for corn. Um, canola, you know, we've, we've got also similar chemistry. So the weed control was not really an issue uh, in the in the male rows of course it's always a bit of an issue but it was no worse or better um dry beans 
Yeah, uh, because we do a, a um, an actual um, cultivation and dammer diking part way into the season, I, I wouldn't say there was any difference on on uh, the weed control wasn't was not the issue I, I expected it might have been. It just seemed that we didn't have many issues. When, when you did your cultivation, so were you cultivating down that that st stubble then? Like, were you cultivating that stubble? That's right. Yeah. So we would cultivate in between the seed rows. Okay. Yeah. Did that cause any plugging issues or anything, or not too bad? No, I was pretty surprised. Yeah. Uh, comment. Okay. Oh, is there another question or comment? Yeah, Ben, uh, in seed canola, did you have any issues mowing out the males? No. Uh, let me think. Where would there be? No. Uh, nope. That was all. Uh, it, it, you know, it, the dirt had settled. The strips, the strips of soil that we tilled, had settled down. So there was, um, there was no issues. So that. That was no different than your conventional tillage ban. And and then Lee asked uh, Greg, some farmers using fall rye as a cover crop, uh, talk about the alleliopathic effect of rye um, in controlling weeds. Is that a fact and is that reliable? And I'd say, yes, that's definitely something with the rye and and probably on, on say rye and then canola, there potentially is some risk that, that rye could actually depending on how you kill it when it's dying could have some impact on that canola actually from what i've seen so yeah some a little risk yeah. i i investigate that pretty pretty heavily on this rye um so i believe that we sprayed a day we sprayed roundup on that rye a day before we strip tilled and i think that if it's killed uh, it's the, I, I think that the, I was, my agronomist figured I was going to be okay and we certainly didn't see an impact. I, I think if you left it without spraying it for rye uh, into the canola, you could have had an issue, but we went and sprayed it just before we strip tilled or, you know, gave it 24 hours. I, I've been told that that rye, I can tell it fully dies, which could take 10 days, it's still secreting some as it's dying. So potentially there could be some risk in some situations, but if you're filling up that zone, you know, how long do you plant your canola after you strip till it? So are you, are you leaving it for a week in that zone that you've tilled? Just about a week. Yeah, probably. Yeah. That, that might yeah, so be what- Maybe that was why there was no issue. Yeah, I'm betting that is actually. And with the tillage, you've actually disturbed it more than if you just left it standing in that zone, so. Uh, Roger, um, are you dammer diking your corn and canola? No, I do not like recreational tillage. <laughs> it's a lot of work. No, we do not. Although there, there may be some benefits. Uh, you know, I talked to some guys out around Brooks Country, and they still think that corn likes to get tickled. Um, I, I don't know. I, we're not. Uh, Luke, uh, what were your challenges with applying fertilizer and do you have any ideas on how to overcome them? Well, getting the right um, seed tank would make a difference. If we had a pressurized seed tank, would have gone in a lot better. And then, of course, as I mentioned, um, the packing that occurred with the narrow wheels. So, so I think both of them are solvable. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of figured out why they spend the big money on the fancy Monag or whatever uh, strip till fertilizer spreaders. Jo uh, Jeff, uh, doing direct plant and direct harvest 15 inch row edible beans in Saskatchewan at around Lake Diefenbaker, uh, we would see a large advantage to spring warming from strip till and they would save a pass um, if they were able to apply that fertilizer in that pass. Uh, and direct straight cutting has been beneficial for erosion for them. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. No, I, and, and Jeff, I know a lot of guys are, you know, further east. So a lot of guys that are, are you know, straight cutting or, um, you know, just um, not doing the undercutting. Um, I, I don't know. I, uh, we got pretty expensive land here. We got the irrigation. And so we're kind of doing everything we can to keep our yields up. 
Um, so I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, how it works on, I, I know it works for guys in Manitoba and, and Saskatchewan around Ethan Baker. Um, the, there's a few guys out towards Madison Hat that are doing that, the same concept, 15 and uh, 15 inch rows. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the strip till thing might still give you a benefit on beans. I'm not sure. But then you're going to have some issues trying to trying to get it narrow enough and and staying on target. Uh, by the way, we we had RTK on both units, uh, and I would say that you kind of do need really good GPS if you're going to seed back onto that roll. John, do you think you would try and do? A, you talked about it like a better ridge, like somehow, so you've actually got like a the strip till, but a little ridge that you're planting into, a little bit of a hill better than what you did can you solve that for this coming year or i think we're getting there yeah i, I mean one of some of the guys in the states use kind of an airbag system on the uh on the the discs that that hold the berm um i don't want to go down that road yet um we're just gonna do a bit more work on getting it set a little better and, and I, I we're towards the end of the season we were getting there so I, I think it's just adjustments. How many horsepower was that tractor that you were strip tilling with, John? I think it was about a 300, I, but it wasn't working that thing. Okay. Like it, it, uh, but we're only at 12 rows too. Okay. Yeah. So a field a day, you could strip till a field a day pretty easy? Yeah, we didn't, uh, it didn't, uh, well, we had an easy spring and we didn't have a lot of uh, weather slowdowns, but no, that all went pretty smooth. So, so John, if you ended up going back to back with, or, or you know, strip till and then something else and then strip till again, could, would, would you plan to go on the same row? Like, can you, can you go RTK and go on the same path that you did the previous year or two years prior? Would that benefit anyway, or? My intention, if we were uh, going to, multi multi-year strip till on the same field uh would be to stay within the same row yeah so you know especially if you had a no-till uh cereal in between or something uh, now the only thing is i'm not sure that we've got our shit together well enough on gps to to duplicate yet but i that would be a target um you know why why mess with that soil you can you can see like on wet, wet years, the strip till helps hold the, the harvest equipment on the, uh, above the ground instead of in the ground. Mm. So it, it can make quite a difference because it, it keeps the soil structure for quite a while. So I don't think there'd be a benefit in going, you know, in between you try and go back on the same strip. When you're seeding then the next year, is it is that risk that feels a little bit too rough or rougher when you come in for your, your wheat crop or something or? Don't have an answer to that yet. We haven't, haven't yeah. done it yet. So I, I don't know. And when you're uh, spraying, are you spraying at an angle or uh, on your crops? Are you spraying the same direction you strip tilled? Like in that, say that dry beans or that corn or that canola crop? Yeah. Um, You know, I, I didn't hear a lot of bitching from the sprayer guy. I think he went across. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, Aubrey's not on, is he? I don't, I, I can't see all the participants. Oh, right now. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I didn't hear a lot of bitching. I, I haven't sprayed for years, so um, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but I, usually I hear about it if there's something, if it's too bumpy. Oh. Um, it, you know, you're you're only you're only six inches out of twenty two, right? So mm -hmm. you've still got quite a bit of firmness. I, I yeah, didn't, don't think. I mean, I've I've heard it. If the guys have to spray across uh, damadiking, I mean, then you hear the grinding, but didn't hear anything on the canola or the corn. So, do I have one more slide or not? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I think that was it. Oh, okay. Well. Yeah. Okay, yeah then the I guess one. the only thing I would say, I thought there was one more, but the only thing I would say, I'm not sure if there's anybody in the crowd here that is strip tilling. 
uh, I'd sure like to stay in touch with anybody who is and do some learning, especially especially on the on the on the Western Prairies here. Um, you know where we have some of the same issues, wind and and um, you know light soils. So if there is anybody, um, I'm on Twitter and uh, Greg knows how to get a hold of me. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind having a, a chat group going if there's anybody who's messing with strip till. Yeah, and, and one, one other question also, um, I could see banned fungicide application possibly saving costs, especially in beans. Yeah, could you ban spray a fungicide on the beans alone? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, not sure. But yeah, but you could save some money. Some of those, some of those fungicides are getting pretty crazy. So I, I don't know what the answer on that one. It probably, you know, we do have some band spraying for canola, so might actually make some sense. Mm. Was there anyone else on the on the call here on the meeting that that is doing some strip tilling or? or wants to make any comments on that, on what they're doing? I do see uh, Adrian on, uh, he actually was in the cornfield a few times. I don't know if you have any comments, Adrian. Yeah, sure. No, I, uh, I did uh, follow along on it and yeah, you covered everything that I was thinking about, especially when you were talking about the corn being uh, a little bit on the or strip tilling and then putting in the corn a little early. Um, yeah, definitely seen how it didn't settle out nicely. So um, I think we chatted yesterday wondering if you had done fall strip till because then potentially you could have settled a little bit more and hopefully you could uh, see a more, little bit more benefit on that. But yeah, this is all a learning curve for myself as well. So I was interested in the follow along and hope to again this year too, if you do more of it, so. Couple more comments also came in. Um, how early in the fall do you plant the rye or other cover crops? I'm assuming kind of after the beans is the question. Um, yeah, so um, <laughs> I, we tried a couple of things. This year was pretty good year. Last year was terrible. We couldn't yeah. we couldn't get any cover crop on. Um, this year wasn't too bad. So we actually just combined the the beans and we were in there probably around the twentieth of, of September. Um, oh, I think it was the first first one was eighteenth. That was for for production for next year, and then the twentieth, and then. I think the last uh, two that were just for cover crops were on the 28th, 23rd, something like that. Um, and it was a good year. I, I, we need to do better. Um, so whether we can spread fertile or spread um, a cover crop into the beans before we cut them, that's one option. I think I think the, whoever it's out by Diefenbaker there, there's a fellow there that can fly um, seed on we don't have anybody right in southern alberta here that does it um the other option i'm thinking seriously that was just get a get a narrow 30 foot disc drill and soon as we swath the beans we would probably uh, we're probably going to try and seed some cover crops so we'll miss 12 feet out of 44 but at least we got going on you know, on, on two thirds of it, just to keep those beans from growing. I mean, that, that picture, that the last picture here, uh, that's enough to convince you, you got to figure out a way to do it. John, I, I know we've talked about it. Like, what about a Valmar on your undercutter um, so that you're, you're putting rye on as you're undercutting? I mean, they're not free, but it's, it's, it's getting the rye on, shooting it ahead of your undercutting and incorporating that rye so it's, it's going then, right? Yeah, the, the one challenge that we have is every once in a while you have beans in a swath for, for three or four weeks. And when you have that and that rye is nicely growing through that cool wet weather, all yeah. of a sudden you got six inches of rye, you know, that you're trying to dry or run through your combine. So that's the one challenge that we've looked at, you know, and, and yeah, eight years out of 10 is not going to be a headache, I guess. 
It'll sit all part of your swath actually, because it's using up the moisture yeah. under it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, we want those beans dry enough to get through the machine. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I still have, you know, all these guys that cover crop in the States, uh, they got a lot longer season than we have. And uh, we will figure it out, but it's, you got a few more challenges than you do in the States. How can, could you, could you reuse your, your fertilizer spreader, John, to go down your sprayer tracks, you know, crisscrossing the beans, you know, and, and put it on with your Valmar yeah. machine there or. Yeah, but those are all options. I, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I, we're, we're going to try what we can try because, you know, we can't expect a year like we had this fall where everything works nice. Mm. Um, you know, you, you got those challenging years and somehow we still have to get that seed on there. Uh, Shark asks, uh, were tire tracks from previous years a problem uh, in the fields? Did they affect the yields? Uh, so which tire tracks are those? Are those from like spraying or, or because we just strip tilled? Was, I, I'm not sure about the question there. So that's like, yeah, tracks from the previous year from harvesting. Um, yeah, spraying, whatever, just compaction. Oh, okay, so so just, just previous year's compaction. Um, now we we did the strip tilling in the spring, so of course we've got the freeze thaw cycle. Um, really, that was not one of our issues um, because that that you know that shank is going in almost eight inches, and uh, yeah, not enough of an issue to to be be anything there. Now we do have access to a vertical um, till disc that if I had a field that kind of looked like heck I even if I was going to strip till I probably would run the vertical till over it just to do that little bit of leveling but that might happen in the fall instead of the spring um does that did I answer it for you there shark yes yeah I was just curious like go back we usually try to work fields quite a bit for beans because we're afraid of compaction so I just thought, yeah, maybe it was so effective. So I don't know. That was all. Yeah. Yeah, Shark. You know, that, that's interesting because one of the reasons not many guys are doing strip till and beans. I talked to a few of them in North Dakota and they were happy with it. But, you know, beans have got such poor roots that one of the reasons I was hoping to see a yield increase, and I do think we got a bit, was, you know, stripping down or, or you know, loosening up the soil down seven inches. Uh, that bean root that we looked at, and it's never much bigger than that or wider. I thought it was down deeper than some years. So maybe we were addressing some compaction there on that issue. I don't know. I, I, that wouldn't be a good one to follow up on. Uh, Jeff says, uh, for beans and canola, did you find the fertilizer band being directly below the ceiling being too hot? Uh, is that a concern in the future? Um, or are you just applying starter and then topping it up with spin spreaders and whatnot after, or your uh, Valmar? Yeah. So on our beans and canola this year, we did not uh, put fertilizer in. I wasn't happy enough with how the fertilizer was working. Um, and, and when we're putting the fertilizer down, we're, we're applying it at about six inches down. So it's gonna take a while for that plant to find it. So I, I wasn't terribly worried about that issue. I, I'm not, that could be a surprise to me, or you know, if, if it is gonna impact it. Um, and, and usually we do some top dressing, um, you know, even canola, we, uh, we apply some uh, with the water, we, we apply some stuff at uh, partial bloom. So we are not putting all the groceries down in the strip. Are oh, you gonna fix my presentation, Greg? You're gonna mess yeah, with I, it for a little bit? I tried to drag this uh, window a little bigger so I can see all the people a little easier. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, is there any other comments or questions or anyone else doing some strip tillage that have some comments on what they're doing so far or? Or any great advice for John? Oh, Steve, you're on mute. Yeah, I'd like advice. That would be good. 
Yeah, just maybe a comment toward John's on the soil health thing. And I and I really do. I really been trying to read up on stuff this winter. I've been watching some of the guys in Montana that are zero tilling sugar beets in. Um, we had an alfalfa field in for four years, sprayed it out, did minimum tillage on it in the spring and seeded sugar beets into it. And when we come back with the harvester in the fall, um, those beets had the deepest tap root on them coming into the digger. Uh, it, it, which conventionally you'd say that shouldn't work because you're seeding into a hard alfalfa field. But once those beets came up, that was the best stand we had all year. Unfortunately, they took a hailstorm. But yeah, I, I really think there's something there that maybe all this tillage, maybe we need to look at it. And yeah, so I think there is a benefit going to come in the soil health field. Yeah, Steve, you know, now that I think about it, I remember seeding directly into a burnt out alfalfa field and man, that soil was mellow. Like, uh, you know, that, that, that crop did really well. Um, so, I, you know, I, 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 I'm pretty sure there's something about it, but, but how do you measure it and how do you replicate it? So, I, like I said, I got opinions. I'm just not sure I should show them in public. <laughs> So, so a couple of years ago, thinking of putting in pipes and pivot trenching, John, I had a customer that was growing some hybrid fall rye and they planted it early September. So it got quite big that fall. The next spring, they had to put a trench in for the pivot and they were putting that in in, yeah, I, I guess it was like early April they were digging it. And he had a picture of it, of, of those roots and those, you know, the top of the rye plant was, you know, it was maybe, you know, like this, this tall, you know, four inches tall on the top. And the roots, they were going down, it was over two feet deep already, maybe even two and a half or three feet. Like it was just crazy how, how deep those roots were going. So I think it really can open up that soil. Um, and even from a potato grower uh, customer uh, doing some rye, he does his hilling in the fall and which can have some erosion risk, of course. And he was putting rye and some clovers on while well, that rye was overwintering. And the next spring he was gaining one mile an hour on his power hilling and doing a better job. So there's, yeah, there's, there's something to that root system in that soil early in the spring. On, on and, you know, maybe some of the, the spud guys, you know, cause they, they, they don't quite strip till they do some power hilling, but they're doing some fall work and oh, yeah. getting ready. maybe there's stuff we can learn there too. I don't know. Well, a few of them are starting to put more rye on top of those hills they create in the fall. Uh, you know, the ripping, the hilling, um, Typically it's on wheat stubble and things like that. So there's still a fair bit there and not as much erosion risk, but uh, that, I mean, they were gaining miles per hour on, on power hilling the next spring and reducing some erosion risk. So, and doing a better job actually, like look how mellow your soil looked when you strip tilled into the, the live rye there, right? Yeah. Uh, I, oh. it, uh, the other thing I, I will mention, just, I know it's not a cover crop talk, but we, uh, we put some winter wheat in and winter rye in, uh, wasn't the hybrid uh, rye, right next to each other. And uh, the root thing on the rye is, is kind of amazing. Like it's, uh, it's on the same day seeding or virtually the same day seeding, uh, the difference in the rye, what's above the ground and below the ground and compared to the winter wheat, it's, there is a difference. Well, it, it's just grow. we can't get enough money for selling this shit. That's all. <laughs> it, it'll it will grow in cooler temperatures, so it'll grow a couple degrees soil temperature cooler. Continue growing versus versus winter wheat, and then the root system. If you look at the the charts, like a scientific thing, it's double the root system uh, of a winter wheat plant uh, on a rye plant. So, kind of is night and day. Uh, Luke says, uh, did you like the row unit you chose um, after using it? Do you think a different one would be better, a better fit for you or, or no? Yeah, I mean, I, the only one I've looked at is, was is Peter Pepnick's, um, which was slightly different than ours. Um, so some guys are going with a triple disc, like so uh, uh, some big cultures. Um, all the rest of them I looked at, they're all kind of similarly built as long as they're solid enough and they don't 
run apart. I, I don't have enough experience to tell you, uh, and I haven't seen enough of them to give you any idea whether it was the right choice or not. Um, it wasn't a bad choice. I just don't know if it was the best out there. There's a lot of people that are big on the horsemen. Um, I just couldn't get a dealer around here. Is there any other comments and questions from, from the group? If you want to unmute, you're welcome to and jump in. Steve, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, just a question on, on cover crops. And John was saying they had a natural cover crop on that one field because of the combine. Yellow. Do you get do you get the same benefit if you just let your volunteers grow all fall versus going back and seeding? A hybrid rye? I don't know. Um, I mean, a wheat and a barley plant and root is different. Um, and then come spring, you know, a rye will be growing in the spring when a lot of erosion happens, whereas those things are frosted off or dead, right? So, yeah. Um, John, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I don't have enough experience there, Steve. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I've, I've never been scared to, like, the big reason that we would kind of till in the fall years ago, the after barley or wheat, was to get all the volunteers to grow. But that was more about keeping the field clean um, and, and worrying about dealing with roots in the spring. Uh, I'm just not as worried about roots in the spring as I used to be. You know, we've got better equipment. And so I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure. Well, as a seller of cover crop products, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what was the reason you offset the rows 12 inches, John? I think it was for spacing. Like you were offsetting it because you couldn't fit it all oh, oh, properly, right? Oh, or? oh so, so the, 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 strip, the strip till um, uh, row units, yeah. So, so we had the front bar and then we had to back them up. We had every other one was backed up 12 inches. So it was just a, in case we had a lot of trash and corn that, that you could get through it. It was, it was just a matter. I didn't want to turn this thing to a, a $75,000 rake. <laughs> so there was somebody who had a question on the fertilizer. So yes, all the fertilizer that I think it's Benjamin, um, all the fertilizer that we applied with this unit was dry granular. Um, the liquid thing, we talked about that briefly too, but you know, the cost of liquid fertilizer is pretty high. Um, and then you've got to handle it. Some of the guys with experience with liquid and, and uh, planters weren't very happy with the splash and, and the rusting and the erosion they had on their planter units. I'm not sure if that'd be the same issue with a strip tiller. Um, so, yeah, if, if, if the price of the fertilizer was the same, I, I think liquid would have some real, it would be a lot easier to deal with, but it's too expensive right now. Good. Any other comments, cool. questions, or as we're kind of nearing the end here, I think, um, but feel free to jump in. I mean, we got time to chat if, if you guys want to chat. John, is there any other crops you'd see a value in this or just that was wide row type crops is, is the fit? Yeah, I, I, you know, for most of our crops, we've got some pretty good no-till drills out there. So I, uh, I don't know why you would mess with a, with a, a solid seeded crop with strip till. Um, I, I just don't know that that would make any sense. I, I think there might be some interest in sugar beets. And, you know, I think this one fellow's on who's in sugar beets. Um, one, of the, one of the outfits that keeps turning out some pretty nice sugar beets um, on very sandy soil, kind of northeast of Vauxhall, uh, they've been strip tilling for quite a few years for erosion control, and then they seed into it. So I'm not sure. I mean, the sugar beet thing, there might be something there. Um, you know, some of the sugar bee guys might 
might be looking at it. I, I don't know enough about sugar beets to know the weed control issues and stuff like that. I, maybe I can add a little bit to that. It's just like corn, John, with the Roundup, the weed control isn't the issue. I think the biggest thing, the beets, they like the warm seed bed early in the spring. So, uh, you know, I know this year we did, um, we did zero till one piece of, uh, of actually was, was taken off for wheat silage. Great. And, um, you know, actually quite happy we did it that way because of the spring that we did have because if that, if we would have tilled that piece of ground it, it would have uh, we probably would have lost that field of beets i would i would, uh, I would guess but yeah the, we're we're always looking at ways of uh, of trying to keep that stuff home, that dirt home because uh this blocks there's too much black soil in the country we, we've seen that the last couple of weeks here yeah so I other than that, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what other crops, Greg. Okay. okay, hopefully this was helpful. I hope somebody learned something. I learned a little bit, at least on, the, on a few things. So. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, John, for joining us. Uh, much appreciated. And yeah, next week, we're hoping to have an event about uh, with XPT Grain on flax and peas on just kind of with their export program with those varieties uh, of those crop types. And then mid next week, we're actually going to have Becca from KWS Cereals out of the US. She's their portfolio, portfolio manager and she's really good up on her agronomy and forage use, feed use, um, just hybrid fall rye in general. So she's going to join us a week from tonight out of from KWS. So Monday we have an event next week and then Wednesday another event. So. You'll see another email uh, Monday morning, 6 a.m. So <laughs> hopefully I'm not overdoing it on the emails, but hopefully we're providing some value with a few events and things like that. So thanks so much for joining us, John, and thank you all for you know, logging on tonight. Thanks, guys. You bet. See ya. Thank you.